you're listening to today at Museum of the Bible. These exclusive conversations with authors, scholars, and specialists visiting the museum focus on how they are currently engaging with the Bible in their lives and work. Welcome to Today at Museum of the Bible. I'm Charlotte Clay. And I'm Jeff Cloa. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Aoife Kelly de Klerk. Thank you so much for being here, Aoife. Thanks for having me, Charlotte. Absolutely. So Eva has an amazing journey that she's going to share with us today. Uh, she won the International Rose of Tralee competition in 2008 and was one of the first winners who visited the White House during the Obama administration for the St. Patrick's Day celebration. Um, in 2009, she moved with her husband to South Africa and they set up a safe deposit program for mothers to give up their unwanted infants safely. And returning to Ireland, she's been uh, working on a fantastic fine art photography project called Testimonies. She actually has an exhibition coming up soon in Belfast. So Aoife, what brings you back to DC with us? Um, so I was in New York uh, last week. We marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, so there were 68 international winners of those three competition and 27 of us traveled over uh, to New York to march in the parade. So that was the Saturday of St. Patrick's weekend. Oh, cool. And I thought while I'm over in this side of the world at all, um, because I live in Ireland, I thought why not make a trip up uh, actually down to Washington <laughs> and uh, get to see the Museum of the Bible, which I really have been following you for so long in South Africa. So it's a real privilege to be here today. Well, that's great. You heard about us in South Africa and uh, you said something about you mentioned this in your master's project uh, early on? Yeah, correct. Uh, That's right. Museum? So yeah. um, as part of my research, as part of the fine art photography program that I'm doing in the University of Ulster in Belfast, my first assignment, uh, I was just rereading it this week as part of my dissertation, and I'd mentioned the Museum of the Bible in it. Mm. So it's amazing how it kind of all comes full circle uh, in the end. So yeah, it's just it's great to be here, though, and it's bigger and more amazing than I ever would have <laughs> perceived even online. So yeah, well, it's amazing great to, to hear. be here. Great mm. to hear that you've enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. What was the mention, if we may ask? The yeah. mention? Yeah. What yeah. Or What was the connection oh, to the museum sorry, that you actually, mentioned? Good, yeah. good question. Yeah. Um, part of my kind of research was all about where does Christian art belong in mm. the art world? Mm. And oftentimes, my argument was that oftentimes it's ghettoized. So it's, oh, yeah. it's actually right. put into one yes. particular part of a museum that's kind of like mm -hmm. the Christian part. Right. Or in a specifically housed um, space yeah, like the Museum space, of the Bible. Right. So, right. And right. my argument was right. that you know, that spirituality can't be removed from the essence of art. Right. Otherwise, what is what is art? And therefore, why would Christian art not belong in the broader landscape of um, mm. of the art world? So yeah. that was my argument, and, and that's why I mentioned um, yourselves uh, as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so Aoife, the uh, Rose of Trilly competition, what is that, and, and what was the result? Yeah, so uh, the Rose Trilly has been a competition that has been running for 65 years mm. in Ireland. So it's the longest standing festival that uh, exists in Ireland. And basically, it is a competition to find an ambassador that would represent Ireland around the world um, for a term of a year. Mm. Um, so you about 2,000 people go into it every year and there's one winner. So it's connecting kind of the Irish at home in Ireland and the Irish diaspora around the world mm -hmm. um, and different centres compete and then it culminates in a week-long event down in Tralee and four million people watch it on TV mm -hmm. and they choose one winner and I'm not quite sure how I won it but, <laughs> <laughs> but I won it. <laughs> and, uh, and then whoever gets to win, you get to travel around the world wow. um, for the year. So um, endorsing uh, Irish businesses, charities, you work at governmental level and the idea is kind of bringing people together and mm -hmm. encouraging dialogue between you know different um, communities of people yeah. and uh, yeah representing different charities so mm -hmm. the year I won it I went to New Zealand Australia Dubai Kenya South Africa wow. and New York and I was up in Washington at the White House um, I thought it was in 2009 and into Europe as well so mm. it's a it's an amazing year and you really do you get to engage with a lot of different types of people and in a lot of different diverse cultures mm -hmm. and I uh, yeah it was an amazing year and actually to mm. be down there in New York with uh, 27 of the winners um, they all came across to march in the New York parade um, wow. they're just an incredible bunch of women like they really are solid honest strong women mm -hmm. and uh, it's great to be amongst them and be sharpened by them and inspired by them so wow. yeah they're great people that's pretty cool yeah. great great opportunity and uh, yeah represent your country yeah. in so many Absolutely. ways yeah sure yeah yeah 
So in this St. Patrick's Day week, what does St. Patrick's Day mean to an Irish native? Hmm. You're asking me now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, it might mean something different. But um, yeah, I suppose when I lived in Scotland for four years when I was doing my undergrad, kind of the whole Irish thing was very associated with alcohol. So oh, it's like wow. best yeah. drinkers, the best. Yeah. And that's what St. Patrick's Day was, was, yeah. was all about. And right. uh, and coming from going down to South Africa then for 14 years, I, you know, I connected with the St. Patrick's Day, but at a distance. Mm. Um, but coming back to Ireland and kind of just really coming back to the idea of Ireland being a land of saints and scholars mm-hmm. and St. Patrick and his, you know, who who I actually have only really in the last two years really it kind of went down into that and understanding right. the role that he played as an English man or an English boy coming right. to Ireland and then right. preaching the gospel and then kind of the whole pagan nation coming to Christ and a hope and a future and and and, and now more than ever before I'm more interested in St. Patrick <laughs> because of his essence rather right. than his association. Um, so yeah, I would love to see I would love to see more people think like that, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and um you know, and I'd love to see more modern day St. Patrick's out there yeah. in Ireland and around the <laughs> yeah. world as well. So, um, yeah, at the we went to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New, uh, yes. in New York mm-hmm. with the right. canon mm-hmm. and uh, we did uh, mass and brought up the communion and um, it, it was just beautiful. It was beautiful to see, well, St. Patrick's Cathedral, the center and court in New York right. City for yes. a start. Right. And I'm so glad it has that position in place. And um, yeah, and it's great to see what it does for the Irish people in terms of bringing Irish people together as yeah. well. So yeah, so it was great. I'm glad I came. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So how, uh, you're working on this photo project. You're uh, yeah. do, do fine art photography. This exhibition coming up in yeah. Belfast, which is pretty cool. Uh, first major exhibition, I assume. Or first. Is it? Wow. Correct. Congratulations. Yes, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about that project. What it is. Uh, unfortunately, we can't show you photos on the uh, on the podcast here. But uh, yeah. can you describe what that is and and maybe how you came up with the idea Mm -hmm. so the kind of the holding body of the work is called grace but the main work i brought to show you today was testimony Mm -hmm. and uh, just for the listeners testimony really came about from 600 kilometers of of walking asking the question how the rocks might cry out um in the absence of conversations around faith in ireland being quite frustrated Mm -hmm. perhaps due to the troubles Mm -hmm. um where religion was associated with the heart of the troubles or whether it's got to do with the church abuse scandals that have come out um uh, sadly that conversation of christ has it just is no longer a comfortable one in ireland um and that was my experience maybe it isn't for many but more often than not it is mm-hmm. um so i took to walking 600 kilometers um across five different countries and looking at uh, the rocks and how rocks might cry out because there's a scripture in luke that says if they don't speak the rocks will cry out yeah. so i kind of took out a literal exploration of how that um how that scripture might be true so um and while i was doing those walks i was actually having conversations with friends and with people around me and i realized okay maybe the people around me immediately aren't speaking but people are speaking people are testifying you know there are stories there are miracles there are healings there there are all these um restorations and revivals and it's happening there are people speaking um and then I was listening to them speaking and I was thinking okay they're talking about testimony that's what they're really doing and then one night I prayed to the Lord for a word what it is he wanted to share with me I opened the Bible and he brought me to Revelations 12 11 where it talked about and they will overcome the accuser the accuser being the devil um, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony so mm-hmm. we know the blood of the lamb has already did, been done through Jesus and um, so it was about the word of our testimony so I kind of was asking myself how do we share the word of our testimony what is our word of our testimony what does that look like how can we how how can I visualize that as a photographer as an artist how can I how does what does what does testimony look like? Well, it's, a, it's a verbal thing, right? But now you're trying to convert it into Visual. photographs. Yeah, correct. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I believe each one of us has been born with a gift. And I really believe the Lord wants us to just use what's in our hands. Mm-hmm. So instead of always chasing what I could have or would want or should have, or if I could have that, then I could. I just think we have been blessed with so much within our hands. And how do we use what's in our hands yeah. to make an impact? So, mm-hmm. um, and so I started seeing, really seeing seeing kind of these lifelines almost like like heartbeats almost across the sky and I thought wow that that could be that life is up and down it is bumpy that could be what testimony looks like so um I started then trying to document my own life story to 
I couldn't expect others to do it if I couldn't do it. Yeah, right. And and through that process, of, which was a frustrated one because I try to understand how might I capture a life story like life is so vast and so huge and so mm-hmm. wide and and deep and uh, but I developed a tool um, with a friend of mine who's an educational psychologist down in South Africa Pally, Kel- Pally Keldenheis and we came up with a tool that would help capture people's life experiences from birth to the present in seven year increments which was important both spiritually and developmentally Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of the grading system of that would be plus five to minus five plus five being um, joy resourcefulness happiness and minus five being challenges and traumas and difficult times Mm -hmm. Um, and so through that people were able to graph their life journey um, across a graph and then thereafter make a representation of their faith um, through Mm -hmm. that journey Mm -hmm. Um, and so my question really was what does testimony look like what's similar what's different you know what new knowledge can we take from being able to vis- visualize people's life mm-hmm. stories and not kind of read it but 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 kind of see it and, and yeah. kind of that whole play back um where the lord first said let there be light and there was light and yeah. it was good and so i'm a photographer and photography is light right. and so right. light and almost it was like an offering back up to him hmm. in a way it was like a a kind of a giving back up. So um, using those graphs, then I went down to South Africa end of last year, which will be December 2023. And across the landscape from which all of those testimonies came from, I scribed in light, um, full body movements, scribed in yeah. light, their life stories and their testimonies to faith. Um, and then, yeah, edited them and printed them and framed them and put them back into each person's hands yeah. and then photographed them, holding them to really go back to that scripture um, where the Lord talks to Timothy, where he was um, referring to his grandmother and his mother yeah. as praying women. Right. So that each person, or praying men, but that each person could take hold of their life story and to um, have some some sense of ownership and empowerment mm. and um, and statement to say actually mm-hmm. this is this is my life and yeah. I am taking hold of it and you this is your inheritance you know I am your praying mother or mm-hmm. I'm your praying father this is the inheritance you belong to because we all get lost along the way so yeah. having that very right. visual reminder of um, well that is where you know raise them in the way they should go and when they're old they will not depart from it so having that visual reference hanging on a wall of your home is very powerful Mm -hmm. as well so um so that kind of that was the process and it was it was an amazing journey it was uh it was and even coming here today you know i prayed this morning lord let me steward well your these testimonies because they're lives yeah they're lives it's very personal very Very. uh, intimate yeah very So yeah, mm. so that's and they, that they were work. willing to share that with you, which is pretty amazing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. There's a there was a huge um, trust. I think trust is definitely trust and time, um, time to do it because it takes time and courage to yeah. go to those places within us and, and and to have the time to reflect and to 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 go back to places that some are more easy to go back to and some mm. are, are less easy or less comfortable. Um, and yeah, it does. It, trust was a big thing, a, yeah. a very big thing. But I know each of them very well. Mm. Um, but in terms of its wider wider application, it is a tool that perhaps could go home with someone. Yeah. And when it, it would when it would be their time to do it in the right place or mm. space, that they could have that um, to work through, to give their life almost kind of when they look at it all together, some kind of meaning and sense of, okay, it actually all balances out. Yeah. And I can see that God is good in this. Like I can mm. see his hand in the ups and the downs. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The images are absolutely powerful. We'll have to link out to them. But it really is cool. It struck me so much to see, you know, the ups and downs of someone's Mm -hmm. life. Because I think when you're, you know, you're everyone's so focused on their own problems, right? And you're not realizing you're thinking maybe someone's on this more linear path or their their life is going so well. But actually it does, you know, it's very evocative for Mm -hmm. just just make you feel the ups and downs of someone's life and then see it pictured over this beautiful landscape Landscape. in South Africa is is incredible. And I think that the the interesting part about that is is in the age we live in where Instagram and TikTok and I don't even know any more platforms I can't (laughs) keep up. But it is that representation of life as linear and always going off the highlight and reel the yeah. highlights yeah. and yeah. and you know I, even when I post myself on my own personal Facebook you know I feel obliged every so often to say guys just a reminder like these are all highlights and yes. either out yeah. of respect to my family or, or the world <laughs> I'm not going to be sharing the low lights yeah. or right. you know right. or there's a right. different platform for that but I think it's so important like for my children when I showed them the work I didn't explain to them the essence of it I just said to them guys These are representations of life. And I just left it. And they looked and they looked and they looked. And my eldest son, Tristan, he looked and he said, 
wow, that one's bumpy. Yeah. And my daughter <laughs> said, wow, life goes up and down. And I said, yeah. exactly. That's go. exactly yeah. it. If that was for me confirmation that yeah. mm-hmm. this is saying what it is to be true. Right. Like, this is what it is to be human, yeah. actually. You know, yeah. that it is, it is real and it's high and it's low, but you'll never stay in the low. You know, mm-hmm. and you'll never stay in the high either. Right. After every low, there's a high and an up and a down and a, and uh, somehow when you look at it across that that expanse, there does seem to be a harmony. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of does all come together. But you know, I just think with the rates of mental health and suicide and addiction at the moment, not just with my work, work needs to point to hope. Like mm-hmm. that is our obligation is to share the message that we know that has taken us from lost to found, that has taken me from lost to found, that that is a hope, there is a, a place for it, and it's not 2,000 years ago, you know, when when the scrolls are written, and the, it's, it's, it's now, it's for now, it's as relevant now as it was then, mm-hmm. and um, and we have it at our disposal, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's in our hands, you know, yeah. and it's there for us to use, but again, it's a choice, and it's something inside, but I really just feel that, the gospel really is about you are loved as you are Mm -hmm. and you don't have to clean up your act to be loved by the Lord he loves you as you are and if that that message needs to be put out to the world Mm -hmm. because you know whether true in being institutionalized or you know it's kind of this you know come to church in a certain way but actually the Lord says come as you are come in your mess come in your come in your come in your sackcloth come but I'm here for you yeah Yeah. yep yep hard pressed on every side as they say but yeah. yeah it's true and i think that um that that is a message of hope that uh, that we can come as we are and, yeah. he, and he loves us it's that kind of known uh, known and fully known loved and fully loved mm. like i just think it's so powerful that mm. kind of idea that he knows us all parts of us and he loves all of us yeah you know yeah. so yeah Amen. So while you were in South Africa, you mm-hmm. started a program called Teva Moshe, which was a safe deposit box uh, for mothers to leave their uh, unwanted mm-hmm. children, right? Mm-hmm. Can you babies. I miss mean, babies? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, actually, a very old tradition, mm. right? Correct. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, how did you come to that, yeah. and what was the impact? I mean, it's uh, uh, tremendous, mm-hmm. right? So it's funny you say that. It is longstanding because there used yeah. to be that idea where the church had kind of like a big stone. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's one. Uh, I was in Malta last year, and they have it's still. There's it's one still there, there. The little turnstile thing. Is it operational? At the church. Uh, well, I mean, it's there. I don't think they use it they anymore. They use it, but, but it would but be still interesting. There. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because that's where it came from. It was. Um, it was so that desperate mothers could yeah. leave their babies. Leave their babies so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, living in South Africa, it's quite a complex country down there, and one that I love very much, but. Um, but human trafficking is a big thing in mm, South Africa. Yeah, so it's a yeah. source country, it's a destination country, and it's also a transit country. Mm. Mm. Um, well, so yeah, it's a very um, common thing. But um, it's also uh, baby abandonment down there is, a, is huge. So mm. 3,500 babies are abandoned every year. Really? Wow. really which, is, which is huge. And then yeah. for every two found dead, one is found alive. Oh, man. So um, there are people in desperate situations out there. Um, yeah. There really are. So um, back in 2018, 2018, just down the road from where we lived in South Africa, there were two baby boys found um, in a drain. Mm. Oh. And uh, that's typically the place, a drain, a port um, bins oh. or in a field. Oh. Yeah, and oftentimes with the umbilical cord mm. still still attached and, mm-hmm. and bleeding not clamped so um yeah and it kind of there's a there's there's so much background to it so much is to do with um just the social situation down yeah. there of of moms leaving kids with their their boyfriends it's got to do with rapes it's got to do with i mean it's yeah. just it, it's endless yeah. um but also as well just pure poverty so for example a girl gets raped or she doesn't get raped she sleeps with someone she gets pregnant and she's not allowed to come home oh. with that child so yeah. she th- they can't feed the child they yeah. can't feed the child right. but there's no facility for her then actually right. to come and say you know in South, in America you have that safe haven law don't yes. you yeah. yes. exactly mm-hmm. so yeah. that is what we're petitioning and trying to legalize in South Africa that you mm. could come with your baby to a fire engine yeah. or yeah. a doctor right. and say I can't right. care for my baby I can't mm-hmm. feed the baby I can't provide nappies for the child the baby's going to get raped like it, i hate to be so blunt about it but that mm-hmm. is the reality yeah. and hand over the baby so as a result baby abandonment is wow. a big issue down there so 
two baby boys were found in a drain down the road in 2018 and from that point I just gathered our friends lots of them um, were in our church or in other churches and I said guys like can we do something can we set something up yeah. so um, and we set up Tefa Mose which is a baby safe deposit box in a township by the name of Macassar so um, it's a unit freestanding unit it is a, it's a box that when you pull down and you put the baby in the weight yeah. of the baby activates an alarm which yeah. um, which then contacts us as a responder the ambulance and the security service um, mm. we have an amazing community group Vita Scola that sponsor that um, and then uh, when they close it back up it locks and mm. it doesn't open until we open it then oh, again yeah. so wow. um, from that point then we take baby to the hospital we link them with the child protection organisation mm. and then um, and the social worker and then they work to try and find the mother oh, okay. because in certain instances it's postnatal depression yeah. and you know yeah. so we try and make sure there's accommodation made for that nine out of ten times you never get back to the mother yeah. um yeah. but the attempt is made after 90 days then if no contact is made with the mother the baby is then put up for adoption mm. so um yeah it's a very sad situation but between our safe and there is a helderberg baby safe as well so mm. in the last uh, seven years there's been 14 babies through oh. so um and there's a 35 safes across south africa now oh, wow. okay. they are actually illegal they are illegal they're illegal but all of the police because they, they don't, have, don't have the law oh, yeah. but the but police long, even I, mean I know yeah. but but because if they're caught abandoning their baby they're arrested oh. but but even the police on the str- the police yeah. are so happy that yeah, they exist course, because yeah. they are tired right. of picking up yeah. dead babies yeah. It's wow. so sad. So um, so we do what we can. So um, I have a group of seven responders, all voluntary. They're incredible down there that we go on rotation um, of every two weeks, every two weeks. Mm. So you're on duty then with the phone for the two weeks wow. um, in that time. So um, it works really, it works really, really well. And actually, to be honest, without the girls, um, I really couldn't, it, it wouldn't happen yeah. actually. Yeah. Without, right. in, and that's the case across all of the safes. Right. It's mainly voluntary, yeah. But wow. it sits under a holding group um, called Baby Safe South Africa. And actually that was formed two years ago now at this stage where all of our independent kind of facilities kind of all house under the one roof and then Mm. they're fighting now for legislation to change or they're fighting for for different um, things to be made in legislation that would facilitate the safe relinquishment, Mm. actually we call it relinquishment, um, of babies. So, um, but it's a long battle and it's a difficult one. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, that's it. And happy we've set it up, you know. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, Mm. so... Yeah. So what brought you um, back to Ireland from South Africa? So, yes, we were in South Africa for 14 years, but after 11 years, um, my husband was working for a French company and he was their only non-French uh, person in global management. So they kept asking him, would he come back to Europe? Would he come back to Paris or yeah. Ireland or anywhere where they could have easier access to him? Because he was sitting so far down in South Africa. Um, without going into too much detail about that, um, they put something on the table and um, we kind of really didn't want to accept that. Um, but we decided we'd pray about it. And if the Lord said go, we'd go. And if the Lord said stay, we'd stay. So um, how I hear from the Lord in all things, actually, regarding to the decisions I need to make in life is I just put the Bible on my chest I ask the question I stick my finger in it I open it and I put my finger down and wherever I open my eyes that is the word I always say I trust you Lord your word is living and I pray that you'll speak to me Mm. and um, and whatever that word is that's what we go with and uh, so that day we said to the Lord okay do you want us to go to Ireland if you say anything about kind of fleeing taking flight leaving exodus we'll go no questions Mm. asked if you say anything about putting roots down, um, anchoring, you know, you know, promised land stay, we're staying, no questions asked. We will not ask a question. Mm. So, and we, we prayed and we did what I just told you. The exact words I landed on were David asking the Lord, shall I go? And then underneath it, go. And even then he did, <laughs> David again asked the Lord, shall I go? And he said, go. And I thought, Lord, you're speaking Irish here. To be sure, to be sure. Yeah, it's a good just, thing you didn't land in Deuteronomy or know, something, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and that literally, it was such a radical, um, when I look back, I mean, it just, it looked mad. It, it was mad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know we did the right thing. Like, I know we did the right thing. And although... Um, life in Ireland for me isn't the same as it was in South Africa and for my husband either. Um, we've had found favor at every single point 
mm. and we've had peace like mm. the peace that surpasses all understanding right. honestly we've had peace in this process and it's everything changing and everything of the world like currencies and marketplaces and all of these other things that were having a, a very tangible and direct um, impact on us we've just had such peace mm. so um, and yeah now we're putting the route down and people ask us are we going to stay and you know, in South Africa, we went for a year and we stayed for 14. So right. going back to Ireland, are we staying? Yes, we're staying. And we'll put the route down deep. And I don't know, the kids say, if you open the Bible yeah, next week, say, it says, go. Don't drop your finger <laughs> on the Bible, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, my parents are there. And um, and I, I really do, I, I really believe the Masters in Fine Art Photography has had a, had a there was a, a mm. particular purpose and a particular meaning that I was here for the, for there in Ireland for this time. Mm-hmm. And I don't see myself going away from that for, for quite some time. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, but as the Lord leads, really, it's yeah. kind of how we live our life. So, oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, us. Aoife, it's great to have you here. Thanks yeah, for thanks, uh, coming all the way to Washington. <laughs> uh, awesome. on, or close to St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite a treat for us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, thanks for sharing your work with us. Where, where can people see your, your website? Yeah, so um, the exhibition will be on in June in Belfast Exposed. And then my website is www.kellydeclerc.com kellydeclerc.com yep that is my fine art photography and I have my um, more capture photography at www.ifa-kelly.com so and Aoife, um, for those of you like me who don't know how to spell it, is uh, A O I F E. Got it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> learned how to pronounce it today. You've done so really well. Today. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Charlie. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you for joining us Thank today you. at Museum of the Bible. Thank you for listening to today at Museum of the Bible. Join us again to hear how authors, scholars, and leaders are engaging with the Bible every day. Only on today at Museum of the Bible.